Hi everybody and welcome back to Nick Talks. This episode's amazing guest is Connor Tomlinson, who is a presenter and writer at The Amazing Lotus Eaters. He's also on GB News, he's also on Talk Radio. He writes for lots and lots of places. What a lot of people don't know about Connor is he's one of the founding members of the British Conservative Alliance. Conservation, they'll, they'll get on my neck about that if I... If I... Let that go unabetted, I'm afraid. Oh, so it's not conservative. It's no conservation. That's the one. Ah, right. Do you know what? When I read it, I automatically read the word conservative instead That's of right, conservation. Loads of, loads of people do, and trust me, there's a, there were a few people in there that weren't quite conservative in constitution. So, right. I'm, I'm glad you've corrected me there, but it's one of those things. I, sw- I suppose that's what you call an unconscious bias, mm. because knowing you, I've read that, and I read what I wanted to read in that. Well, you were. You were you were hoping that someone was yelling at the Tory party enough to actually be conservative, and, and woe beside you for making that mistake because nobody. Is <laughs> um, so thanks for correcting me on that, and I'm I'm I must read more carefully going forward. And the other thing I found really interesting was you've done work with the Adam Institute, and part of that work to influence government policy as well. Um, so welcome to the podcast. Is there anything else you want to talk about on that introduction that I missed out or or that I need correcting on? No, no, not off the top of my head. I'm not, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make a, a habit of being pedantic about words. I'll, I'll try not to because normally I have a tendency to waffle on and, and say enough incriminating things myself. So don't worry, mate. No, but it's important when someone says something that's actually incorrect and people need correcting at that point. And I, and I'm glad you've pulled me and done it because, like I said, I read what I wanted to read on that because I just thought that's what it meant. Um, We've met each other several times now when I've come down to the Lotus Eaters office when I've been on, I come on like once a month. I'm I'm on again, is it next week or the week after? Um, About 10 days time, I I think I'm down again. So I'll see you again there in person. Um, You're more, not more interesting, you're slightly different to the other presenters and the other people working at Lotus Eaters because you've already got quite a large background in politics um, it, that seems to have been I mean, and, and I even mean mainstream politics as opposed to just being someone who comments on other people in politics um, how how did you become politicized and is there a story behind that that we don't know I I don't really think I've told it all that much so this should be an exclusive. A world exclusive on Nick There Talks. we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was always on the outskirts of political movements when I was younger, but mainly from a cultural perspective. I've always been a major comic book nerd as maybe the one of three shelves in this very tiny box room behind me may give away. And I wasn't big on political philosophy or the actual ins and outs of the parliamentary system, but I did have this intuitive sense that my hobby and interests were being perverted by outside forces who had dark designs for me. Like, one of the main things was in, in 2011, DC rebooted their entire line, restarting all their comics from number one, like it was the French Revolution year zero, including action comics, which at that point had had about 900 odd issues and, and Superman had been running since 1938. And they rebooted it not only to be dark and edgy and hip, but they overthrew some of their characters with racial and gender recasting, like, like the beloved Flash of 1990s, who was very relatable, because he'd grown up as a kid sidekick and the, his uncle had died and he'd taken up the mantle. And it was about becoming a man. And some of these, these really solid stories to, that are instructive to young men. And they were like, and here's a hip inner city black kid to replace him because he hasn't been in it. And everyone went, that's not our favourite character. And they went, that's because you're a racist. And I didn't have the the philosophical toolkit to explain why I was frustrated with that happening. But I knew in my gut it wasn't quite right. But I, I wasn't too involved in politics. <sighs> until I was in uni about 2017 when I realised I didn't particularly like a lot of the nonsense my classmates were espousing and so in private I was watching the SJW cringe compilations and all that sort of thing that was happening at the time and then in 2018 weirdly enough Cole came to our university campus and Sargon of Akkad had a lot of seaters for those who may not say off the top of their head and he caused quite the stink with the local Antifa and feminist chapters and the person who had invited him was Callum from Lotus Eaters, and he was in the student society. So yeah, we went to uni together. He was the, he was the year above. We, we didn't spend a lot of time together at that time, but but since all of the fallout with Carl's event and um, the student societies and student unions 
persecuting us for some edgy jokes which got leaked from a group chat and saying oh well the nazis used humor to recruit their members so you're there for a nazi which was insane and there were actual members of the student union involved in the antifa group who were putting messages like um, let's bait them into being violent to shut them down so we went through all that debacle and, and Callum and I helped the actual society compile the evidence and, and say, OK, well, this outside group that's trying to take down a student society, which platformed the first Israeli and Palestinian ambassadors for a conversation on the UK university campus ever, who, who raised thousands of pounds for anti-FGM charities. We did all this good work. Meanwhile, our opponents were graffitiing the sports centre with our name F us and, and crass things like that. Well, it turns out there was a, a conspiratorial cabal of other lecturers from other universities, local Antifa members and students all conspiring together to try and take us down. But we got nowhere because the student union was on their side. So, so after that was defunct, what ended up happening was some of our members splintered off and, and did various things. I know one person started Orthodox Conservatives group. One person got involved with the pro-life group in the UK. And then one of my friends, Chris Barnard, went on to start the British Conservation Alliance, which was modelled after the American Conservation Coalition in the US, which told the Republicans don't cede the grounds of the Green New Deal to the leftists because environmental policy is going to be the next frontier for economic prosperity and personal rights. And also the Americans, given the Republican bases are held up in the rural states, they've got interests in hunting and farming and things like that. So they have an easy in on saying, well, ecological policy is not just the, the domain of the rabid leftists who want to dispense with coal and make us all poor and shivered to death so over here we turned around and said this is something that our government's going along with as is every government because i suppose it's a conspiracy theory to state that every government is pushing policies for 2030 almost like there's some kind of agenda there but there you go but of course the british countryside is an institution of our own making it's been generations of being tilled and shaped and and the woodlands that britain so famously has romantic poetry written about it wouldn't exist if it went for the industrial revolution because we were cutting down trees till the apex of about 1550 when wood prices were so expensive that many people couldn't eat and all it took was one genius to create coal rather than charcoal and then the whole world gets upgraded and, and suddenly we have forests rejuvenated but anyway so we, we thought we'd pitch all these arguments from a conservative perspective at least from the outset, it, it mortars got muddied as, as presidents changed hands and the charity commission got involved, as I'm sure you know, there are a bunch of lefties. And we thought we'd pitch our ideas for a more libertarian governance structure, but a conservative sentiment to the conservative government who weren't really doing either at that time. And this was before the 2019 election, even. And I got involved through that because I was doing a lot of volunteer writing. I was never paid for any of my work for BCA, by the way, just so anyone knows. And I did quite a few podcast appearances and, and things like that. It got to about 2021 when I took over as the policy head around 2020, because I de facto ran the policy department, even though I wasn't the head from when it started, but neither here nor there. I won't throw shade on any former colleagues. And the Adam Smith Institute approached us to write a paper that they would then edit and promote to speak on three policies from the perspective of f privately funding it rather than the government just wasting taxpayer money on it because they saw it as an incremental step towards improving how the net zero policies had captured our economic system so and, and this is part of the reason why i've basically abandoned westminster politics is because i don't like this weird negotiation where it takes 10 months to 12 months to get a sort of paper out and then the government are going to ignore you and do what they did anyway but anyway so so the adam smith institute who I, I ended up writing the paper for a few months and then they ended up tripling the word count by all the revisions. So by the time I got it out, I was glad to be shot of it. But I'm, I'm very glad I did it because of two reasons. One, it, it springboarded me into the wider policy sphere of Westminster. And, and I do think I brought that insider knowledge of how things work to low seaters, because as you said, having a political background means that you understand how, how power dynamics and just the interpersonal relations of how policies are passed and, and certain special interests get pushed through is a decent asset um, that may have been missing. And also it, it meant that I I had like a bad taste in my mouth. I, I wasn't I wasn't particularly idealistic because even though they listened to one of my proposals in the paper, which was privately funding nuclear power stations so we didn't have to go to the Chinese or the French, um, one's less bad than the other, but only marginally, uh, for funding because 
otherwise you know it takes 10 years to build so new tech new specifications the budget always outpaces what's originally done so end up the taxpayer ends up being on the hook for it and we hate that rather than doing that the energy companies can foot the bill and then we get cheap energy and they get a profit that'd be a great idea and they included that in the, in the nuclear financing bill of 2022 but then none of the other proposals were looked at all of their other proposals for the other policies seem to have such clear errors that i couldn't believe that hundreds of researchers well paid in whitehall far better paid than i was hadn't spotted these problems and so it just meant that i was disaffected enough to be not a neutral arbiter but to to scrutinize all of these things that are happening at the moment with with a degree of cynicism that meant i could be a pretty effective harsh critic and so i went from from doing that for quite a while after after cop 26 i was basically done with it especially because it, again it felt like people were rather than questioning the presuppositions of the policy were trying to minimize the amount of damage that was done by an agenda that already been set on and so I was freelance writing for a while, doing my own opinion stuff, doing movie reviews and policy reviews for American Spectator, going on talk on GB News. I, I had a Monday night show with Kevin O'Sullivan, which was very good for quite a while um, until a little blacklisting event from Mike Graham. And then the entire um, apparatus of the network changed hands and they refunctioned their programming, but neither here nor there. And what ended up happening with Lower Seas was I, I knew a couple of the lads well, let's let me stop you there. We'll we'll, we'll get into Lotus Eaters. Um, a couple of things you've talked about that I, that I want to have a look at a bit deeper. The first one is, um, is it cartoons? Is the right way to describe it? Magazines, comic books, comic. That's it, comic there books. <clears throat> have you seen a film called Unbreakable? Yeah, and it's one of my favourites. Harry and I to leak leak this. Harry and I are actually covering that in our comics corner in episode five, so next month. Well, I've never been into comics, but that's a fantastic film. And the take, the what I loved about that. There's two things I loved about that. The first one was comics themselves. They, no, the, the whole story is about these are ancient stories that are passed down and they've exaggerated over time. That's why you know. Superman is a Superman because he's been exaggerated over time. That's why when you draw a Superman, he's got a bigger chest, a, a square, a, draw, a jaw. And it's these are the stories that boys have always wanted to hear. And these are the characters and the people boys want to copy. They're, they're the heroes. And that's why there's always a good guy. And that's why he's always protecting people, doing the right thing. He, he, that's why they always get hurt. That's why they always have a weakness because you can't be a superhero without a weakness. Otherwise, you're not really a superhero because you, you, you're you not doing things and risking anything because you can't be. A, that's why they've all got, you know, a kryptonite or in the film, Bruce Willis can't swim and can drown easily. And I love the way they put that into that movie, that these are the stories boys need to hear so they can be better men, better husbands, better people in society. Um, and so I'd like you to take on that. And the other thing you talked about was when you started working um, within politics. I started working at Manchester Council um, a couple of decades ago. And one of the biggest feelings I had when I first started working there was how stupid everybody is. And I, I thought, I thought they'd be cleverer people than at the council, but they're going to be in 10 Downing Street. But the people in the council I actually thought were going to be very clever, switched on, intelligent, well-educated, smart, have got the finger on. And I got there, kid off a council estate, never been to university. And I sat there for years going, I'm surrounded by idiots, absolute idiots. And I include myself in that. I'm not saying I was better than him, but I'm looking around going, you of all, either as stupid as me, or worse than me, and you're running the great city of Manchester. But it's worse than that. They don't even know the limits of their own intelligence. They've got that Dunning-Kruger effect arrogance of thinking they know how to rationally reorder the world, but they don't know what they don't know. So we, this is why we're, we're living under the tyranny of the midwits and why both parties are, are completely unanimous in, in moving in lockstep with whatever orders they're given from international institutions like the UN, because they see them as better people and the UN are staffed by imbeciles anyway. So it's, it's like that phrase turtles all the way down, but with, with 
people just utterly incapable of doing things. Um, as for the unbreakable point, I mean, not to spoil all Harry and I's content, because we'll be going into the sequels as well, but that is one of my favourite films of all time. And, and one of the main scenes that is most instructive as to the utility of storytelling, particularly for men, is the scene at the end where he holds up the newspaper to show that he saved the children from the serial killer. And the son's got tears in his eyes and just goes, and they both keep that secret. And that bit gets to me all the time. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cold hearted bastard, but um, that always chokes me up. And, and the reason is, especially as well, I think pop culture has largely supplanted religion. And for, for many men who are emasculated and growing up in single mother households without a positive masculine role model around, lots of them do retreat to these kinds of vicarious achievements in video games or over consuming terrible Marvel movies as a, a supplementary way of instructing values that they otherwise would have been raised with. But I'm very lucky to still have both sets of grandparents around, to still have my dad who made plenty of sacrifices growing up and, and to this day says, oh, I didn't spend as much time with you as I want, but we were dirt poor. When I, was, when I was born, he took any job he could get. He was driving buses for 15 grand a year and then ended up working nine shifts a week for 40K from the time I was about five to 15, you know. Um, every house we, we've bought has been a wreck and it's been done up from scratch. We've only just finished doing this place up after seven years and we bought it with the original windows it had since 1918. And we tore up the carpets and there were old Second World War papers as the underlay. You know, it's, it's a horrible place. So so really worked from there. But that that grafting attitude has taught me the value of hard work. And it's made me a bit of a workaholic, which isn't always that healthy. But I know lots of men who, who don't have that that natural instinct for knowing what is good for them and for delaying gratification in order to pursue it. And that's why I get, to be fair, I get a lot of flack from online morons. When I say, you know, delay gratification, don't sit around just consuming pornography and video games and, and whatnot all the time. Make yourself, not in the Jordan Peterson thing of, of treat yourself as someone worthy of helping, but constitute yourself as someone strong enough to care for those who deserve it and then do that. Because, and I, I think it's, it might be a failing in, in my part, but I know lots of men who don't really have the airy fairy romantic metaphysical sense of love that a lot of women or a lot of fiction does, but do see love as duty. And we find a lot of meaning in, in serving others who definitely deserve to be protected and provided for. And I think that is the, the, the main crux of the power fantasy of the superhero, or at least it was before it was perverted and subverted by progressives. And I think that's why hopefully our message resonates and our attempts to reclaim and recontextualize the good stories like Harry and I do in Comics Corner um, within the, the canon of Anglospheric values. That's an attempt to be a bulwark against the exact kind of progressivism that has left men feeling miserable and nihilistic. I'd, I'd much rather more unbreakables than I would pregnant jokers. I don't know if you saw that this week, but that sort of just makes me want to tear my hair out. No, I mean, everybody needs, especially everybody needs someone to look up to someone to aspire to that's how we get the best out of everybody boys girls men women black white gay doesn't matter who you are we all need people to aspire to because if you've not got anyone to aspire to that means you've reached the top and me and you both know no matter who you are in the world you've not reached the top there's always more you can do more you can say you can always better yourself and with comics, let's go back to comics. What I like about comic comics again is the fact that although superheroes do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and almost every superhero is anonymous, they're not tweeting what they're doing. They're not saying, look what I've done, aren't I amazing? Selfie! No. That's why they wear masks, because they because once you start getting credit for doing the right things that then can warp what you do are you then doing because it's the right thing to do or are you doing because of the credit you're going to receive for doing it and then you're not sure why you're doing it do you start doing things slightly different because that gets you more credit and then you go down the route of popularity then and that's what superheroes are not it's not about being popular it's about doing the right thing for the right reasons and I don't care what anybody else says. Good examples, Batman, you know, from, from what I, I don't read comics, but from the films and all that, Batman at many times is considered a vigilante, is considered a criminal. Um, but he doesn't care because he knows he's doing the right things. Um, and I think comics have got a lot 
especially for young boys, to show him the right thing to do in life. And then with the villains, that's why the villains have always ex-friends of the superheroes, because that teaches you that the villain isn't created in a lab. The villain isn't the devil. The villain is someone just like you, someone who was your friend, who took the easy route, who had some, you know, bad luck, but then took the wrong path. And that's why the villains are always relatable as well, because we need to understand that the hero and the villains in all of us, it just depends what path we take, depends on which one comes to the front. Mm, well, your, your point about doing good for good's sake, I, I think that you can see with the progressive paradigm that's overtaken comics and, and basically proceeded actually around 2014 when Carl got involved in Gamergate. Pop culture preceded all of politics being taken over by this, this doctrine of the ultimate liberation of the will, like the trans activists say, you know, I've got, I've got a man's soul and a woman's body and therefore I must destroy the body to, to liberate my soul because biology itself is, a, is oppression. That sort of long march of, of self-determination it is exemplified by the interactions of heroes and villains in comics, because if the heroes are acting as a corrective measure to the presence of injustice, but they're not doing it for personal acclaim, then they must be fighting on behalf of some sort of natural law, something that C.S. Lewis would call the Tao. It's like the undercurrents of reality that's best to live in congruity with. And that predates us. That's the void before human consciousness, right? So if we're to live in, in concert with that, and that leads us to be most successful, then that means we don't necessarily just live for ourselves and our values didn't come ex nihilo. It, it's something which we recognise rather than formulate. And, and that kind of syncs up with the idea of when Nietzsche got it wrong was when you kill God, there's, there's nothing after it. We can't transvalue and create our own values. We can only continually discover the things which predate us. But the villains aren't like the heroes which are aligned with a set of, of eternal values that are corrective measures. They're one of two things. They're either like nihilistic hedonists like the Joker who run around and, and attract women like Harley Quinn and, and discolor their hair and, and do all sorts of things for their pleasure. And when you, when you extricate some sort of objective value from your morals, you do just re reduce all morality to like warring competing preferences. This is what the postmodernists are right about, except the postmodernists only get there because they got rid of God in the first place or, or the Tao or objective law or whatever you want to call it. Right. And so if you have those competing preferences, why should you delay gratification for the good, like continuing civilization and not just endlessly coom and consume in the present? Why is not everything reduced down to hedonic calculus? And if everyone does that, trying to be this atomized consumer freed of social bonds because somehow responsibility is tyranny if everyone's doing that in concert then civilization just mutually collapses while everyone's having an orgy and too busy to notice right and then the other villains are the utopian imperialists who wish to impose their self-formulated worldview on you and I think you can see this as well with the perverse incentives of modern social media, because it has the dopamine hits of being reaffirmed by your tribe with likes. And it allows people who rather than inherit values, which is de-egocentrizing, if they progenate values and then they define themselves as infallibly correct, that incentivizes narcissists, manipulative people and psychopaths who only have the ability to appear charismatic short term, but burn themselves out in the long term to rise quickly like the cream of the crop to the top of your movement. And suddenly your movement that is aiming for absolute power is led by the exact kind of person you don't want in charge of society. But unfortunately, the, the ability to provide a platform to as many people as possible. Yes, it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's decentralized the knowledge distribution from the corporate press. And now we can just point and mock them. But unfortunately, within subcultures, it means a bunch of nutcases are running the show. And that's why we have to exist to push back on it. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So if we're looking at... I don't know how to word this. So excuse me if it comes across a bit clumsy. So there's a human trait where it's about giving. It's about looking after our tribe, our community, because that's how we get the best for us and our family our surroundings and it makes a nice community to live in but then there's also a human trait about individualism which is also a natural trait there's no point in me giving everything to my community if it means i lose my life and i've not got enough food to eat to eat so both those traits are valuable for everybody it's that balance of, of how you manage both those traits and mainly because of the society we've had now since the second world war that has been disturbed and then with social media it's been disturbed even more and we, we we're the same creatures we've always been we've just lost our way and then with the death of god 
we don't know. We're tribal creatures. Most people are sheep and they will do as a tribal leader says them to do because that was the only way the tribe would survive. And if you had a tribe full of leaders, that tribe would die because you can't have a tribe full of leaders. You need one leader, otherwise you don't know which way you're running. So that's built into our DNA. But now we've not, and that was replaced by God at a certain extent in our country, also the king or the queen and head of state as well in other countries like presidents. But now we're losing all that. We're going down the road of hedonism, as you said. Well, that's fine to a certain extent, but there's nothing beyond that. Hence why, is it a quarter of women are on antidepressants? Why men are killing themselves at an extremely high rate? It's because once you get past that new handbag or that new type of porn, what's beyond that? And the answer is nothing. So life's not worth living. So you're depressed or you kill yourself. There's a lack of meaning in the West, a real lack of meaning. The disequilibration falls into two camps, I see. And and I think, I do think it's gender specific. And I think the dominant paradigm is now a very pathologically feminized way of governance, mainly because of female enfranchisement, female enrollment in the workforce. And lots of women have been manipulated against their own self-interest by resentful feminists who have the express desire, like Simone de Beauvoir, to abolish the family and discontinue the human race by abolishing reproduction. But that's that's because it's in an eight to nine hundred page book. Most people don't realize that they instead just masquerade it as liberation. Right. Um, so the the issue that you have is with the excess giving of all you have under the guise of compassion it allows crises to be confected or exaggerated by the exact kind of narcissists and machiavellians that we said we don't want leave, leading the movement and that excuses the dispensation of moral principles in crisis time to then suddenly lock you in your house for two years and take all the money and forget about the consequences because we really have to fix this right now and then when the next crisis comes along and the next the reserves are always depleted but you're constantly taking from someone else and i do think that is a it's like the devouring mother bear or the the devouring mother archetype in in mythological fiction um gad sad came up with a phrase for it called like collective munchausen by proxy where you are feigning your suffering in caring for another group or person who is suffering and so getting the clout of the crowd for how much you've sacrificed to do the right thing and be the right person and and take that person's money over there because they're evil and give it to the group that really really need it Whereas you are overlooking all of the social impacts that that has, like the pathological import of a bunch of refugees, self-described refugees, adventurers on dinghies, let's just say as is, who have antithetical values to the country that made this country great, but want all the money that is the outgrowth of the fact that we had an excellent culture. And we are expected to work to then have about a third of our income tax so they can piddle that away on cigarettes and chews every day, right? Not good. And then the other side of that is the extrication of people from communities because they see the collectivism the involuntary collectivism of the left and think well i don't want to be a part of that so i'll just shut myself off from politics the, the kind of like 90s teenager mentality that's now gone to its real nihilistic endpoint of where men are just checking out right the, the japanese call this herbivorous men the kinds that don't want to date that are addicted to pornography that are overeating and you wonder why incel culture has risen up now i understand i've got a bit of compassion with some men who really don't feel that their genetic ceiling is that high and they don't think they can they can manifest attraction especially when women are paralyzed by analysis because they see the best and richest men on dating apps and at any time they can sleep with pretty much any of them if you edit your photos enough and have low enough standards for your own propriety right but frankly a lot of men can really fix their stuff by just getting down the gym training cultivating their sense of ethics earning but there are a lot of perverse incentives in society which set you against that. The lack of fatherhood, of course, and the fact that, again, you're taxed to death by these insanely faux, compassionate, feminized governance structures that take away half your income and mean that lads like me can't get a house till their, their late 20s, early 30s, if that. But all the other people will get a skip ahead of you in the line. So what we really need is not just what the Westminster bubble keeps saying about build more houses or or lower tax brackets we we need a cultural reconstitution not a revolution towards what the leftists say but but a, a melding the appropriate golden mean between being an individual but also building yourself up as an individual and then it doesn't just stop there it's not like selfishness is in and of itself a virtue it's that there is great meaning in serving those who are least capable this was the sort of like revolutionary idea that the christians had over the romans and that there's not something virtuous in being weak but we, there is something virtuous in showing compassion to those who are genuinely incapable of bettering themselves. 
And sometimes those who haven't yet understood how to better themselves, but you can give them a helping hand, much like the Good Samaritan, and they can, through restitution, build themselves up and, and serve you in kind, reciprocal altruism. And I think we've lost that kind of sense. And with that, we've lost a sense of manhood that finds great meaning in looking after those who need it. That reminds me of something Jordan Peterson said, because obviously he's big into the Bible, reads the Bible, does lectures on different books of the Bible. And he talked about a famous phrase in the Bible, which we've probably all heard of, that the meek shall inevit the, the earth. And then um, he looked into the meaning of that and got different interpretations of the original text, which was Hebrew, but then it went through Greek and then into Latin, then into English. And we've got this perverted version of the Bible. So he went back to the Hebrew scholars and found out what it means. And they say what it actually means is not the meek shall inevit the earth. It said, he who has a sword, but yet keeps it sheathed, will inevit the earth. See, I, I, so the translation I found as well, and this might be the, the Greek version, I discussed this with Carl in our book club on Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, was actually he who manifests the warrior spirit of a bridled battle horse who does not charge of a head of his time will inherit the earth. And that actually, the sword one syncs up with the later verse that Christ says, obviously, sell your cloak so that you can at least own a sword. But then the, the horse one syncs up with the rest of Revelations where Christ comes and rides in to usher in the judgment on the back of the white horse so both both interpretations or translations are, are pretty accurate yeah but they're completely different to the one we read in the bible today which has a different meaning altogether so the one today means the meek shall never the other thing there's nothing virtuous about being meek but there is if you, but there is any other sayings as in a powerful man with a weapon who doesn't use his power or his weapon to get his own way will inevit the earth i think that has a different meaning altogether and that's what we miss now in society is men being men men have been demonized since for the last hundred years i'm writing a book at the moment on feminism and a lot of it i talk a lot about this um it's a demonization of men It's anything that's male is actually toxic it's negative it's mansplaining it's man spreading it's everything negative is has a male connotation to it it would be it'd be wonderful if they started woman understanding but i suppose there's a lot too much to ask yeah because because that's the opposite of that is to say women are stupid they don't want but we would never say those things and you couldn't say those things even if you thought they were true which they're not because women are not stupid they're just different to us um i talked to someone the other day um about the difference between men and women men and women are different we don't understand women the way women think but do you know what women don't understand the way men think we're different but when we come together in a relationship to raise children it's the perfect partnership to raise children because we all bring different things to the table and that's what we're missing and men are missing those role models i mean i've spent two decades now working on the streets with kids Deprived areas, you know, inner city areas, no dads at home, involved in low level crime, kicked out of school, kicked out of youth clubs. I'm working with all sorts of kids and it's the only role model they can see is a local drug dealer. And that's not really a role model, but that's the only positive male with status. It's not positive. It's the only male with status they can see in their life is the drug dealer. Who's, who people are either a bit afraid of, he seems to have money, he's doing something in the community that people want, need, require, regardless if you think it's right or wrong. But at home, it's full of women, school, full of women, TV, full of women. Where's the positive, positive role models on TV? You look at The Simpsons, you look at Family Guy, the male role models are the idiots. There, 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 isn't, there isn't anybody anymore now you can look at and go, I want to be him. So boys are lost, completely lost. Yeah, they've had their motivation castrated. And, and I think we do see this in the education system. Of, and I had this very much growing up in that you are disincentivized to compete because of how the classroom itself is structured, because you're meant to be sitting, you're meant to be passive. And you have, especially with GCSEs, a breadth approach to knowledge rather than specifying. This is why the, the do maths until 18 thing is starting to annoy me because it's basically turning you into the sort of managerial instinct of a bank manager which shock Rishi Sunak's pushing that of where we can just perfectly tabulate in a spreadsheet how society should be run and we don't need a metaphysic and, and we don't need something higher than ourselves and a grand narrative to engage in because people have different 
interest. But anyway, the, the fact that boys are disencouraged to compete as they're developing means that by being put off from, from competition entirely, they either quit or they cultivate that sense of resentment they were never allowed to engage in the first place. The golden mean of that is to allow men to compete with each other and then adequately find their place in the hierarchy because then you don't get resentful about the fact that you haven't achieved the potential you think you have. Instead, you're kind of happy with your lot in life. It's the same thing when I said about par paralysis by analysis where women constantly want to trade up. And, and there's, that, there's that stat by online dating where men rate about the mean of women as very attractive, whereas most women rate most men as unattractive and about 0% of women rated men a 10 out of 10. You know, it's so infinitesimally small, it was it was ridiculous. But lots of these women are hunting for things about 80% of women are hunting for about 20% of men. So they're all competing for the highest level. And so because they aren't selecting a partner that could make them perfectly happy as their grandmothers did within the local community, you know, my, my, my nan and granddad have been married for over 50 years and one lived in poplar one lived in dagenham and they just used to go to the same pub on the same night and you know they've got kids and in fact i'd see them every weekend it's fantastically wholesome whereas many women are going to, to their 30s having slept with triple digit body count but finding the inability to settle down and so where we haven't had not only our choices constrained by social obligations which are sometimes healthy with us but we also haven't had the avenues to properly manifest the virtues and potential that we have everyone's in this kind of limbo state and, and Carl has been talking to me about this as well. And he, he had a lecture on a stream the other day to a bunch of guys who, before he joined the stream, were talking about dating in a purely transactional method. He said, because of the abundance of options and interconnectivity we have for, for my generation, men and women don't really think about their relationships as bonds of sentiment anymore or, or love or duty or affectation. They just think of like, what can we mutually exploit out of one another, you know? And, I, and when you said there's a lack of male role models, I do think this is why, and I don't want to harp on about it too much, but the likes of Tate, especially in Jordan Peterson's absence, has risen to the top because lots of young men see on TikTok Bugattis and multiple attractive women and think that's the, the warlord conquering spirit is the pinnacle of what to aspire to rather than the head of the household who is deeply respected by a, a smaller amount of people, but is it's more meaningful than having the whole world look at how many fast cars you own, you know? So, so a long way around is it's not that men need to enter the education system because you're going to be get kept out of that anyway. And frankly, and this is comes back to the idea of why people populate government jobs are kind of midwits. They like the security of never being able to turfed out. It's the old phrase of those that can't do teach, but um, I don't want to disparage that because my mom and my sister are teachers. So I'm going to get bollocking later, but I, I think it's more so that we need using the internet and likewise to disperse throughout culture male role models that allow men to at least stick out the feminized education system and then manifest their virtue while they're out there. And also the word no in your repertoire is pretty brilliant, brilliant. And um, a lot of women respect disagreeable men. So when people start screeching at you, oh, that's sexist. Oh, your, your stereotype is like, no, no, I'm not, no. And I actually, I don't think you, you believe what you believe. And so you can sit there and whine all you like, but either you're propagandizing other women to be childless, barren and sad, or you're just going along with the crowd and you don't desperately want this. And I think, I think more men need to manifest that spirit and, and be leaders rather than the, the sheep you referred to earlier. No, definitely. And part, you're right. Part of this is the education. Don't forget we're in state education for 11 years. You know, we're funding this. I have a lot. I, I used to be based in schools. I have a lot of work in schools. Our education system at the moment is designed by women, run by women for the benefit of girls. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that's a Machiavellian aim of theirs to do that. That just happens to be the way it is. Boys are criticized on a daily basis for not being more like the girls. Can you put your hand up, Jimmy? Don't shout out like that. Be like Margaret, put your hand up and wait your turn. Can you all sit down, boys? You're running around too much. Um, we're going to read a book. Well, we, the boys don't find it interesting, but it'd be an interesting book for the boys to read if it was about pirates, if it was about spacemen blowing up planets and shooting each other. They'd read those books, but we're trying, we're trying to make boys be more like girls, which, and it'd, be, it'd be also be wrong if it was a way around, if we were trying to make the girls to be more like boys. That would be wrong as well. So we're treating boys really, really badly all the way through those 11 years of education. And we wonder why. 
probably one in five it is, it's about 18% of children leave our state system after 11 years of education and have failed it, have not met government standards. 18%, one in five kids were failing because the one size fits all education system isn't, isn't good for them. They need something else and we're not addressing that. And a lot of those boys in that 18% <clears throat> are tomorrow's criminals, are tomorrow's welfare dependents. So it's not like they don't cost us and are not a drain on society and not a negative society. They are after we failed them. If you've been to school for 11 years and every day we're telling you, you're stupid, sit down, put your hand down, stop messing around. After 11 years of that, we wonder why 16 year old boys, some boys leave school angry and violent. We've taught, we've tortured them. I can actually speak to that, frankly. Um, this isn't really something I've discussed before, but when I was in secondary school, uh, you hear this phrase after COVID of quiet quitting. Well, I think I mastered that on the run up to the GCCs because I just didn't care. I, I, I was totally checked out. I, I don't actually remember being 15, particularly because I spent most of it either asleep or just switched off and, and very depressed. And I had a, a very tumultuous relationship when I was 16, which I won't get into, but it, it put me in quite a dark place. And I, I'd lost a, a substantial amount of weight and, and didn't do all that well in in my GCSE exams and it, it actually took the the limiting of the subjects that I took at A level the finding of an extracurricular group of friends to manage shows on and a lot of work put into things like training and I mean I, I, I took state-funded therapy but that was so unhelpful because we were crammed into a group because of a lack of resources and I was the only one talking because I was the only bloke in the room as well so there we go but I, I made the best of it for myself and it took all that to, to start reconstituting myself and, and funnily enough that didn't really reach its apotheosis until I got into university I found myself at odds with all my classmates I was forced to speak up for the things that I was intuitively in favor of I, I defended myself from the the onslaught of our student society by my uh, student union and uh, simultaneous to that happening i had uh, another girlfriend who had lived with for a couple of years um i'll be careful with my wording here uh, misplace some of my funds and possessions and we actually had a, a, a short legal battle about that which i was proud to win but uh, during that time i found the likes of professor peterson and uh, stefan molyneux and uh, even frankly even carl you know i've, I've told him he's a, he's a bit of inspiration from mine even from the start and reconstituted my sense of self, not just in my personal relationships and my political beliefs and my philosophy, but just understanding that I actually needed to put in the work to earn the confidence that I admired in others and knew I didn't have yet. Um, and so the education system poorly equips boys for understanding what their purpose in life is. Well, I have made a career orating and speaking about literature and things like that, but I was totally switched off to it because I was just writing for the exam and studying reprehensible leftist texts like J.B. Priestley's and Inspector Calls, which the moral of that it tries to teach you is um, capitalism bad, don't take responsibility for yourself and your family, and if some local prostitute drinks bleach, it's your fault. Thanks. Cheers, education system, for that. And it wasn't really until sick form as well that where one teacher took an interest in, in me um, and she taught the texts in a more exploratory way and, and did this sort of interconnected method of bringing in secondary criticism and, and going through it and properly exploring it. And eventually, as well, you, you can tell the difference of a decent teacher because she gave me a postcard when I went off to university um, to study literature and because I was feeling aimless before that. And she actually encouraged that in me. I'm glad I did, even though the course was a bit rubbish. And she gave me a postcard with a quote from... Uh, the catcher in the right on it and i actually hadn't read the book at the time but i've i've got it here it's one of my favorites fantastic and it, it, i think she selected it out because she could detect i was a bit of a hole in caulfield figure of where i'm deeply cynical still am a little bit a bit depressed and aimless but much like holden and much like many men find duty in caring for those who who most deserve it the the end of catcher in the right is that he shakes himself out of his depression and, and reconstitutes himself because he sees how wholesome it is to see his little sister riding the carousel while he stands in the rain and if you don't have the toolkit to identify those things which are worth you latching onto and being a good enough person to, well, to, to put it sadly, be alive and around and present enough to observe and, and facilitate, you know, make, help people make memories, then th that's the thing the education system to fail to equip boys for that. But that is that is a purpose you do really need to lean into. So you, you do need to build yourself up. You do need to get educated. And just because school is terrible and doing a disservice, I mean, frankly, I'm, I'm very glad to participate in something like Lotus Eaters and the fact that the internet 
exists to the limit it isn't censored to try and give men that renewed sense of purpose where we can get educated and strong and, and do things that matter you know i think society is not only destroying boys it's destroying girls just in different ways we we're not teaching boys or girls the importance of life the importance of family of community of country and it's having a negative effect on both sexes um just just differently because the sexes are different um all right final question let's talk about lotus eaters how how did you get involved with lotus eaters how did you get a job there how are you finding it i think it's a fantastic podcast I think it's a podcast that's showing the way to everybody else about this is how you run a podcast. It's not the Carl um, Benjamin show. He easily could have made it the Carl Benjamin show, but he hasn't. He's not always on. He has he's employed other people to be presenters, to be writers. There's a fantastic team there. I think I've said before, the first time I went, I thought there'd be three people in the office. I thought there would be um, Callum, Carl, and someone who knows about cameras and the internet. And I turned up, there's like a dozen people sat there and another five desks that were empty because they weren't in at that particular moment. Um, it's a huge production. I think it's fantastic. How did you get involved in all that? Uh, so other than just knowing Callum for years and speaking to him over Facebook about when they were setting everything up and they were hammering the the place together <laughs> um, uh, there's a video of that online of them putting up the sound boards and that people go watch and it's, it's an amusing little time lapse because they told me because i wasn't around until two years into the business it, it, it was rough start when they first started the website didn't work for a month they were worried josh had moved down to swindon and, and taken out a loan to move in he was worried he was gonna have to pack up and go back to plymouth but but yeah so i i got started because i'd spoken to a couple of the lads over twitter and, and knew them tacitly like harry and, and john wheatley and, and thomas and I had been invited by John Wheatley to go and discuss what, some of our mutual favourite books, which was Ursula Le Guin's Laugh of Heaven. He liked some of the other novels and he had read that. And I was just a bit of a literature nerd. So I already had an existing profile doing Talk and GB. And they were just like, yeah, come in one afternoon and we'll have you as a guest. And I'd already written for the outlet a couple of times because I'd spoken to Rory and I'd, I'd written two articles by that point. And when I came in, I had been let know that Thomas was actually leaving because he had to go back to recommit to his PhD in York because he was balancing PhD and Lotus and he was feeling very burned out and he didn't want to live in Swindon and God, I don't blame him. And I, I came in and John was actually ill the day that I had booked my train ticket and was ready to go. And so Callum put something together last minute to talk about immigration and housing and, and we did my inaugural episode together. And Carl afterwards went, oh, do you think that went well? And I was like, yeah. So we went, oh, do you want to go get a cup of tea? And we walked into the kitchen. He went, so when can you start? <laughs> so I was taking a, a little off off guard and and i i had to spend some time because i've been self-employed writing for about a year by then i was making okay money you know and uh, similar to what i sort of do now but i realized that it would be a significant time commitment and and i knew that it would i'd either have to up sticks or commute in which is what i do now i, I get two and a half hours of trains each way every day so you know up let let me stop you there you're on a train for two five hours a day yeah i'm i'm I'm, I'm up at five. I leave the house at half past six. I get in at nine. I leave the office at five o'clock and I'm home by eight. Jesus. I like, I like the podcast of the Lotus Eaters. I would not be doing that at any stage in my life. I don't think I could have done that. I just couldn't. I, I, I mean, I am a, I'm a bit of a neurotic workaholic anyway, so. I, I actually couldn't rest over the entire Christmas period. I had 10 days off. I was really looking forward to it. And then I just ended up working in private. And uh, my family and my girlfriend were just like, really, just, just turn your phone off. Come on, seriously. You know, we actually want you present here. And it's a, it's a trait I need, to, I need to get under control. But the reason I do it, frankly, is because, as you said, Carl has basically deputized a bunch of us and gives us complete free reign over our passion projects and, and what we most like to enjoy. Because we're engaged in a, a disseminated but mutual project of trying to remoralize our country and, and, and improve how men can have a relationship with, with women, how women can understand men in many respects. And it, it's a bottom-up cultural revolution, just not the, the one the Maoists want, you know. And I wouldn't have that anywhere else. It, there's nowhere else that I would be able to go and talk about biblical references in comics and and for people to actually give it out, you know. And, and I am very appreciative to 
have been afforded this opportunity and i would be a mug to squander it as many of our viewers who both like and dislike me would happily tell me in order to take the job in the comment section and as as you've already referred to as well with Carl building up such a robust team. I think it's about 15 of us in the office now. We just hired a new editor because we're making so much content. Each of these people I work with is a genuine privilege. Bo makes me feel like the dumbest man in the world because he is just a living compendium of historical knowledge. Harry and I speak like we're old friends at the back of the maths class, just dicking around, but somehow still getting full marks. You know, yeah, Josh is fantastic. Everyone I sincerely respect and, and call friends, and I'm so glad to, to work there. Again, I'd be stupid not to just sacrifice a bit of time and a bit of sleep in order to do something I sincerely love. Are you thinking at all of moving to Swinton? No, it's horrible. It is like invasion of the concrete shoe boxes. And uh, uh, frankly, I, so I had this, I had this chat with my girlfriend the other night who lives in Reading and cause she goes to, she works and goes to university in London, but it's a lot cheaper than living in what is slowly becoming one of the worst cities in the world. And Reading is just, reprehensible it's a multicultural melting pot where no one really speaks the same language and all of the independent places are vaguely ethnic and don't represent me and they're not very well taken care of and then everything else is just this global homogenization invasion by soulless chains like starbucks and subway and mcdonald's and swindon very much feels like that but it also has the desolate feeling of a call of duty map and I understand where Carl lives is quite nice, uh, but I don't drive. Uh, sod cycling. And at this time, trying to move somewhere rather than save to actually hopefully own a house one day if the WEF don't get their way and make it that we own nothing and are happy or miserable in my case, it, it would be suicide to get onto the renting market. You know, so So I'd rather sacrifice the time and just hop a train. And I would imagine those five hours a day sat on a train, you're, you're being productive. Yeah, I, I, I work constantly like I, I i do all my segments i i read plenty but it's why and some people have actually complained about this and i i see you know you're never going to be liked by everyone are you i mean i mean i i see comments 18 months into harry's tenure calling him smug so you're never going to win all the audience over but that's why some people some people have complained oh it's basically the connor show on this channel now and it's like no guys i'm just i'm just doing loads of content i i i, I frustrate Vicky and and our editors to no end because I'm constantly dropping things on their desks to put on the website and, and whatnot and it's just because I'm I'm spending an extra few hours every day doing stuff in order to get to because my brain's burning and I, I've just got to get it out otherwise I'll forget it forever so so yeah I, I, I spend a lot of time just reading writing and, and listening to bits and pieces I've always got a podcast for people who who you're not their favorite presenter which is nothing wrong with that we've all we know we all like certain people for certain reasons but if that's the case well, those people don't have to listen to you or read what you wrote. Well, I'm, I'm really you're, happy. You're just offering more stuff for them for free. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that I have so many genuinely esteemed colleagues who can, who can offer alternative content on alternative topics and cater to everyone's taste. And that's, that's actually the great thing about where we work is that we practically do cater to everyone on, quote, our side of the aisle. And we're all so disagreeable that sometimes we will tell you what you don't want to hear. Like, yeah, being being addicted to weird kind of porn is kind of bad for you. Like, shock. Yeah, you should you should go to the gym and go and earn a girlfriend. Yeah, but being being just sitting online permanently and coming up with weird schematics about how the third position will save the world and, and you're going to be in charge of the absolute monarchy. Lads, try and re live in reality. Like, we're actually trying to get something done here so we can have a, a sort of safe, full, peace, quiet country, you know? So we are going to, we are going to, shatty fantasies a little bit and sometimes i'll be the bad guy but as, as stefan molyneux once said the um the great thing about being a philosopher is you'll be reviled in the present but thanked in the future and if that's the case then you're doing your job right so if people are mad at me that's that's totally fine i'm happy that that hopefully you'll end up listening to me in the future and if i'm wrong well all right i'm gonna be the one that suffers from that aren't i yeah no absolutely fantastic final question nice quick question to end up. i'm gonna put you on the spot you don't know this is coming I can see the sweat dripping down your brow already. Have you read my book yet? The one I gave you? The one that's on the shelf? No, I haven't. <laughs> Genuinely, because I'm backed up. I've got I've got January and February booked up, but I can commit to possibly us doing a book club in the future when we'll schedule some time. Right. Fantastic. Well, make make sure and we're talking about my first book, um, Lessons in Courage. I think I gave um Carl my latest book that came out last last month, six weeks ago. The making of a beggar and i'm hoping to finish my third book 
I probably need four, five, maybe six weeks now to get it done. I'm a bit, bit, bit behind. But then it'll go to publishers, and we're probably looking six months, end of the year before I'm that's published. I'm very interested in the feminism one because I've actually read a lot of original feminist texts. Carl and I, to, to give an exclusive, we are doing a book club on Simone de Beauvoir's A Second Sex next week after next because I'm going to subject him to 900 pages of the worst thing I've ever read. So I will be intrigued to see your conclusions on the feminist movement. My, my books are not academic. My books are not, I read this book, you know, from the 18th century. No, 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 no. I don't read books. Those I, I, don't, I haven't got the energy or the time to read crap. Mine are all, I suppose a lot of it's points of view, but I do a lot of research. I look at a lot of um, governments and university studies on certain things. I try to pull that information in. And then on top of all that is basically my opinion, which is the most important opinion to me. I, 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 had this, I had this conversation with um, a friend of mine earlier who went on a date with someone who's very well versed in philosophy. And she did say, I really wanted to get to know him, but sometimes you just bring up random philosophers. And I felt like he was out, like, like an academic citing too many footnotes. He was outsourcing his intuition to other people. And frankly, most of the best texts throughout history weren't just rights of reply. You know, Edmund Burke aside. Yeah, and I think that's where I'm sort of coming from of all my books. It's, this is what I've learned over 54 years of being alive, of all my experiences, which are unique, because we're all unique individuals. This is what I think, this is, this is why I think it, it may be a load of rubbish, but this is what I think, and this is how I've got to this point. Yeah, that's the only thing. I, th I think sometimes my, uh, my, my age may work against me in the message I put across, because um, don't get me wrong, all, all the stress of life in the past few years has given me a little bit of grey in my beard but uh yeah sometimes sometimes it, it can seem a little bit absurd that someone is so affirmative in the wisdom he's trying to put out when he's only 24. <laughs> yeah and that's just something you're going to have to cope with because even when you're 54 you'll have an 84 year old saying to you what what do you know at 54 I'm eight. So it, that's one of those problems that you'll always have to deal with. But I thoroughly enjoyed this, Connor. So thank you for coming on my podcast. Um, I'll see you in a couple of weeks down at your office um, and enjoy the rest of the evening. How can people find you? How can people follow you? Of course, people need to go to Lotus Eater's website, join and be a member. Is it £5 a month, I believe? Yeah, £5 a month for all our premium. That is, talk about value for money. Five pound a month for all the content you guys produce is value for money. Um, but how can people follow you personally? Uh, you can uh, pretty much everything. It's con underscore Tomlinson, C O N underscore T O M L I N S O N. And that's where I normally tweet out either our Lotus E segments and articles or if I'm going on another network, which happens sporadically these days. But um, still enjoy shouting at the mainstream. It's always good fun. No, fantastic. Thanks again. I'll see you soon.